Hi, this is Scott Garibay, and today I'm going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons 6th Edition, um, Chesterson's Fence, Gary Gygax, and Clerics. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so let me explain what Chesterson's Fence is. Chesterson's Fence is a principle, okay? Uh, it is a essentially like a rule to live by. And what Chesterton and the Chesterton's fence principle specifically says that if you come across a fence and you don't know why that fence is there, do not take it down. Right? And the reason why is, you know, the idea is there's a reason that fence is there. You don't know it. And if you take that, that fence down without knowing the reason the fence is there, you're gonna pay a consequence. That might be a, a bad consequence. It might be a catastrophic consequence, okay? Now, I'm a big, big, big fan of principles, right? And the reason why is life is challenging and, and our thoughts and our time are taken up by many, many, many issues in life, right? But if you have principles, you have rules to live by, right? And it just makes life much simpler. So I really think absolutely, without a doubt, Chesterton's fence needs to be heavily, heavily on the minds of the Dungeons & Dragons 6th edition design team, saying, if you don't know why something's in the game, you darn well better not take it out of the game, okay? So we're gonna talk about what I think they're gonna try to take out of the game, um, and, and why we should be looking at Chesterton's fence, right? And then, uh, and, and we'll, we'll go forward on that, right? But uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this. So what I, I just want to take a brief moment and say why I think we need to pay attention to principles and why the Dungeons & Dragons 6th edition team should pay attention to this principle, specifically Chesterton's fence, right? So here, here's the issue, right? I, I'm a firm believer in principles because it just makes life a lot simpler, and you're not, you know, doing one-off thought experiments every time something comes up, right? So I'll give you an example of this, right? So I remember when I was young, probably I was about 12, 13 years old, uh, maybe a little earlier than that, about 10 or 11. I remember asking my dad, I said, Dad, what kind of work should I do, right? And uh, he said, he said, well, son, you should, uh, you should do whatever kind of work you like. It's important. Do something you enjoy, right? Which is like, that's old saw wisdom, right? And I was like, mm hmm, okay, Dad, thanks. And then I remember my dad was, you know, kind of like, he gave me a lot of one-off answers, you know, because like, he, you know, he, he was a busy guy, right? And I remember him just thinking on my, on my question for a minute and adding something. And he added a principle. A principle I work, a principle I use in my life, a rule I live by to this day. He looked over and he said, you know what? And he, he added to this to what he was saying before. He's like, don't work in food. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, don't work in food. Here's why. Right? He goes, the hours are long, the money is short, and it is messy. Right? And I was like, oh, okay, Dad, thanks. And then you know, I kind of toddled off to do whatever I was doing, right? But over the years, I found my dad was 100% right. Like, so one... Um, I, I worked in food like twice just because I it was the job that was available, right? And I couldn't find something better. And uh, both times he was 100% right about the messy part. And um, I got a job at like a rib place once. And, you know, I remember just having to like throw away people's half-gnawed ribs. And it was a mess, right? And, and in addition to that, he was 100% right. The hours were very long. I had to close the store. And I was making maybe a dollar more than uh, minimum wage. You know, I went and moved into tech. Tech is straight, like tech is Tundra Wolf style awesome. It is awesome. It, I cannot, uh, I cannot recommend tech high enough, right? But that was a principle my dad gave me. He said, "Don't work in food," right? And so every time you know I need to find a new job, which is not too often because I work in tech, and that is a very very stable job right now. Uh, and I've been very blessed to build a strong skill set. Um, I, I do not ever think about going and finding a job in food, right? So, you know, like that's uh, that's something that, you know, it's a principle he gave me, right? So my point is, Chesterton's Fence is a good, sound principle. And it should absolutely be applied to 
uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I'm going to bring one. So what are they going to take out of 6th edition, right? What do I think they're going to take out of 6th edition? Well, I'll tell you right now, there's a deadlock. The word race is gone. It's out of there. Now, let's apply Chesterton's uh, fence to that. Why was the, ra the word race put into Dungeons and Dragons to begin with, right? Well, I know why. I, I, I feel very confident. I know why Gary Gygax used the word race for Elf and for um, uh, for elf and for dwarf and for human. One, I think, uh, I think there's several reasons. One, I think it's the same word that um, that Tolkien used. Tolkien used that word to refer to those primary races that are in Dungeons and Dragons, right? Here's the second reason why Gary Gygax put the word race into Dungeons and Dragons. Because in 1974, when he, in 1972 and 1973, when he was writing it, right? And when 1974, when he published it for the first time, race did not mean what it means today, right? It did not contain the cultural and societal and political freight of division, right? Now, like, I, I understand there was certainly divisiveness over the word, but people were fighting over the rights that different, different races had. Not the word race was not just like um, nobody was thinking about applying like civil rights to fictional characters, right? Nowadays, you know, civil rights for fictional characters is a very real thing that we discuss in depth, right? And we use stories as incredible tools for allegory. And I think you know, right now, not a single tabletop role playing game designer in the world who is not ignorant of the current political, cultural, and societal strife that is going on in America around the word race would possibly put that get that word into their game going forward. That word is going to be removed from every single TRPG going forward, okay? It's gone. Chesterton's Fence. We know why it's there. We can remove it. Remove it. Okay. Here's the next one. Here's, here's what's going to be on the chopping block for 6th edition, all right? Todd Krennic uh, came out and said, hey, wizard should be able to heal. Fight me, right? That was, that was a tweet straight from Todd Krennic, right? Who was right upon the design team for Dungeons and Dragons, right? So in my opinion, I am saying now that I think the idea right now is bouncing around within the Dungeons and Dragons design team to take Cleric out of 6th edition. Why would you do this, right? Now, one, I want to say right now, I'm not sure if that's a good idea or a bad idea, right? And uh, the reason why is it's complicated, all right? But I'm going to talk a little bit about it. All right, so why would you take Cleric out of Dungeons & Dragons? Well, here's the biggest reason, okay? Uh, wizards, um, fighters, and rogues, they are not religiously-based characters. Clerics are religiously based characters. They get their power from gods. Okay? Gods is a big, big word in America now that is under more debate than ever. Okay? And the reality is, by and large, American society is uh, is de religious is is getting religion getting rid of religion. The nuns, N-O-N-E. Uh, are rising. These numbers, this is a fact, right? There are more nuns all the time. People who are not, uh, a nun is someone who is religiously affiliated with the religion of none, right? Uh, they have no religion that they are affiliated with. And that is a rising group in America, right? And, it, and increasingly, it is harder for all traditional churches uh, and, and I think even non-traditional churches to get anybody to come to church on Sunday and so religion is going down in the U.S. It is. There's just, this is this is not a debatable subject. Pew does these studies, and this is happening. Like this is it's just a fact, right? Along with the the reduction of religion, um, marriage is going way way down, and then also in America we're having less kids. These are trends, right? So cleric is intimately bound with religion, right? And so that that's just a fact, right? It's just it's just a hardcore fact, right? Just from the definition of cleric, right? And so basically, the idea would be 
that, you know, why on earth should D&D be a vector? Why should it be a, a carrier for religious ideas, right? And, and that would be the idea why you would consider taking Cleric out of Dungeons and Dragons. Here's the problem with that, right? Now, I want to say this. I, I'm a deeply religious person, um, and uh, I don't know if Cleric should be in Dungeons and Dragons or not anymore. And the reason why is I care deeply about religion, but I don't care very deeply on whether religion is in Dungeons and Dragons or not, right? And the reason why is my religion is very important to me, and for that, you know, I, I deal with that in my church and I deal with that in my home. Uh, it's not a major theme within my hobbies. It absolutely does color how I approach that ha that hobby, but it's not the central thread, right? And um, so, you know, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there, right? So, but here's why I think the Dungeons and Dragons, the, the design team, 6th edition, needs to very, very carefully think about Chesterton's fence when it comes to the cleric, because here's the kicker. I don't think anybody knows why the cleric is in Dungeons and Dragons. I don't think anybody knows why Gary Gygax put the cleric in Dungeons and Dragons. I think you could write two or three books on that topic alone, right? And the reality is, uh, Gary put it in there, right? And the other thing is, uh, wizards are already ridiculously powerful compared to uh, fighters and rogues. Here, here's my issue. One, I know this is going to be controversial. I love 4th edition. I really like 4th edition a lot. One of the things that 4th edition did that I thought was just stellar was it gave every single class an equal amount of pages. 30, 35 pages for fighter, 30, 35 pages for rogue, 30, 35 pages for cleric, 30, 35 pages for wizard, right? Look at 5th edition. A hundred and, like, 120 pages of spells... And what, you got maybe 20 pages for a fighter? You know what I mean? It's wrong. It is absolutely wrong to... So the thing is, the wizards are chock full of wind already. You can't just add healing to them. That is a major, major problem. And I think it could shake the foundations of the game, right? So I 100% understand why the design team from a political, cultural, and social standpoint might consider removing the cleric, but I'm not sure they can do it, and the reason why is, I'm not going to say, oh, you can't do it because, you know, a religious person doesn't want you to. I'm saying just a sound principle, right? I don't think anybody knows why, uh, why Gary Gygax put it into the game. And if you don't know why it was put into the game, then you need to be incredibly careful about removing it. You need to be very, very careful about removing that, um, you know, removing Cleric from the game. It's a Chesterton's fence situation. If you don't know why Gary Gygax put Cleric into the game, then you really shouldn't remove it, right? And so, so right now, I, I, I'm not sure there's enough time to pull it out before you get there. So I think the Cleric's gonna have to stay in, right? But I am predicting right now, I think Cleric's on the on the chopping block, and I think it will be discussed to be removed based on Todd Krennic's um, tweet, right? But I really think it's a bad idea not um, uh, uh, to remove it. And I'm not saying that from a religious perspective. I'm saying that from a logic perspective, right? Uh, I think it's a very clear Chesterton's friend's fence situation. What do you think? Why do you think Gary Gygax put Cleric into the game, right? It's a, it's a pretty interesting question. What's your opinion on Chesterton's fence? Do you think there's other situations where the Dungeons & Dragons design team should think very carefully before they remove something from the game in Dungeons & Dragons 6th edition? I appreciate you considering these, these questions. Please let me know below in the comments. And please consider liking and subscribing. Take care.